While Wyatt Earp was in Wichita and Dodge, his brothers were on separate paths that would also lead them to Tombstone. His older brother, Virgil, was in Dodge City at the same time as Wyatt, but it's not clear if he was ever on the marshal's or sheriff's force. But in October 1877, Virgil and his wife moved to Prescott, then the capital of the Arizona Territory. He earned the respect of the law enforcement there when he assisted the sheriff during a gun battle in the street. The Weekly Arizona Journal Miner. Shortly after his arrival here, and while Ed Bowers was sheriff of Yapavi County, the town was visited by two cowboys from the Bradshaw Basin section who enlivened matters by shooting up saloons and other resorts. Finally, riding out of the place, shooting right and left as they went in the direction of the Brooks Ranch, just outside of the city limits. Arriving at the Brooks Ranch, the cowboys sent word to the officers that they were camped there, and if any of the officers wanted them to come out and get them. These men were considered bad ones and were known to be dead shots. Sheriff Bowers organized a posse of citizens, of which Virgil Earp happened to be one, and the posse started for the Brooks Ranch on horseback, preceded by a deputy United States Marshal Stanford and another deputy in a hack. The party in the hack passed the bad men unmolested, but the cowboys opened fire on the sheriff's posse, which was on horseback. Sheriff Bowers' horse was shot in several places, but he returned the fire and did not get hit. On arriving at the scene, Virgil Earp, who was armed with a Henry rifle, proceeded up the creek in the direction of the shooting and noticed one of the cowboys crouching under an oak tree, reloading his gun, shot, and killed him instantly. The first shot hit him in the heart and the second shot struck about two inches from the first. The other cowboy was shot with a charge of buckshot and lived for two days, finally dying in the hospital. Not long after this incident, Virgil was elected constable of Prescott. A year later, he was also appointed deputy U.S. Marshal for Eastern Pima County. Wyatt's younger brother, Morgan Earp, also worked as a lawman in Butte, Montana. He also worked as a shotgun messenger for Wells Fargo a job that Virgil and Wyatt would take from time to time. Shotgun messengers were considered private lawmen, somewhat like Pinkerton agents. Wells Fargo agents would guard the company's strong box, carried on a stagecoach, to discourage would-be robbers. Typically, Morgan would ride shotgun, sitting to the driver's left, cradling a sawed-off 10 or 12-gauge shotgun. In 1879, the town of Tombstone, Arizona, was established. The Earps began arriving that year. Virgil Earp was the first to move to Tombstone with his wife, Allie. When Tombstone was discovered, I was in Prescott. The first stage that went out of Prescott toward Tombstone was robbed. Robberies were frequent and became expensive and the disordered condition of the new country soon brought a demand for the better protection of business and money, as well as life. I was asked to go to Tombstone in my capacity as United States Marshal and went. The Tombstone country is of a particular character, the community being unsettled and dangerous. Most of the businessmen there stayed simply to make enough money to live somewhere else comfortably. And of course, the greatest object with them is to have as much money as possible spent in the town and to get as much of it as they can, careless of the means of dispensation or the results of the rough manners. Aside from the legitimate businessmen, the bulk of the residents are idle or desperate characters, most of them coming into town broke and depending upon the gambling tables or criminal ventures to supply them with the means of livelihood and dissipation. As a deputy U.S. Marshal, Virgil Earp had a position that carried a fair amount of prestige, if providing little in the way of income. Virgil would have authority across a broader area than town marshals or county sheriffs, and he could coordinate larger operations with them. 
Wyatt, and his common-law wife, Maddie, soon joined his brother. In 1879, Dodge City was beginning to lose much of the snap which had given it a charm to men of restless blood, and I decided to move to Tombstone, which was just building up a reputation. Doc Holliday thought he would move with me. Big Nose Kate had left him long before. They were always a quarrelsome couple and settled in Las Vegas, New Mexico. He looked her up en route and the old tenderness reasserting itself, she resolved to throw in her lot with his in Arizona. As for me, I was tired of the trial of a peace officer's life and wanted no more of it. Despite Wyatt's wishes, he was soon working as a private law enforcement officer. For the first eight months, I worked as a shotgun messenger for Wells Fargo and Company, and beyond the occasional excitement of an abortive holdup attempt and a few excursions after cattle thieves and homicides in my official capacity, everything was quiet as the grave. Then the proprietors of the Oriental, the biggest gambling house in town, offered to take me into partnership. Wyatt reported, that the owners of the Oriental were having trouble with some rough customers who were trying to run them out of town. Wyatt's reputation, backed up by his physical presence, turned things around. But he also found another occupation at about the same time. Six mules had been stolen from the U.S. Army Camp Rucker, 75 miles east of Tombstone. Lieutenant J.H. Hurst led a group of soldiers looking for these mules, and in Tombstone, he collected several men to assist him. Virgil, Wyatt, and Morgan Earp, along with Wells Fargo agent Marshall Williams, went along. They followed the trail to the McLory Ranch along the Baba Kamari River. After we arrived at McClurry's Ranch, there was a man by the name of Frank Patterson, he made some kind of a compromise with Captain Hurst. Captain Hurst come to us boys and told us he had made this compromise and by so doing, he would get his mules back. We insisted on following them up. Hurst prevailed on us to go back to Tombstone and so we came back. Hurst told us two or three weeks afterwards that they would not give up the mules to him after we left, saying that they only wanted to get us away that they could stand the soldiers off. Hurst cautioned me and my brothers, Virgil and Morgan, to look out for those men as they had made some threats against our lives. The McClory's were members of a loosely organized criminal outfit called the Cowboys, who rustled cattle from ranches in Sonora, Mexico, and sold them in the U.S. They were also reputed to be involved in other crimes as well. The Cowboys numbered at one time nearly 200. Most of them are what we call saddlers, living almost wholly in the saddle and largely engaged in raiding into Sonora and adjacent country and stealing cattle which they sell in Tombstone. It is rarely that any of these stolen cattle are recovered. When the thieves are closely pursued and it seems likely that they will be overhauled and the stock recovered, the cowboys sell the cattle to some of the butchers practically in partnership with them. And I know of cases where the finest cattle in the country have been sold at a dollar a head. When cattle are not handy, the cowboys rob stages and engage in similar enterprises to raise money. As soon as they are in funds, they ride into town, drink, gamble, and fight. One might expect that criminals such as the cowboys would be universally reviled, but it was more complicated than that. They spend their money as free as water in the saloons, dance houses, or faro banks, and this is one reason they have so many friends in town. All that large class of degraded characters who gather the crumbs of such carouses stand ready to assist them out of any trouble or into any pain rascality. The saloons and gambling houses into whose treasuries most of the money is ultimately turned, receive them cordially and must be called warm friends of the cowboys. A good many of the merchants fear to express themselves against the criminal element, 
because they want to keep the patronage of the cowboys' friends, and the result is that when any conflict between the officers and cattle thieves or stage robbers occurs, followed up by shootings around town, most of the expression of opinion comes from the desperado class and their friends and the men who should speak loudest and most decisively to correct the condition of affairs are generally the quietest. An officer doing his duty must rely almost entirely upon his own conscience for encouragement. The sympathy of the respectable portion of the community may be with him, but it is not openly expressed. Wyatt would soon discover that for himself. Not long after he helped track down the stolen army mules, Wyatt Earp was hired by Pima County Sheriff Charlie Chabelle. Wyatt was made a deputy sheriff of Tombstone, and since the sheriff was based in Tucson, Wyatt and a fellow deputy had a lot of freedom in Tombstone. It wasn't long before Wyatt was butting heads with the cowboys again. On October 28, 1880, some cowboys were out shooting up the town near midnight. Tombstone Epitaph, October 28, 1880. A lot of Texas cowboys, as they're called, began firing at the moon and stars on Allen Street near 6th. City Marshal White interfered to prevent violation of the city ordinance and was ruthlessly shot by one of the number. Deputy Sheriff Earp, who is ever to the front when duty calls, arrived just in the nick of time. Seeing the marshal fall, he promptly knocked his assailant down with a six-shooter and as promptly locked him up, and with the assistance of his brothers Virgil and Morgan, went in the pursuit of the others. The wound is serious, though not a fatal one. Too much praise cannot be given to the marshal for his gallant attempt to arrest the violators of the ordinance, nor to Deputy Sheriff Earp and his brothers for the energy displayed in bringing the malefactors to arrest. At last accounts, Marshal White was sleeping, and strong hopes of his ultimate recovery were expected. Unfortunately, Marshal White did not survive the injury. The gunman in question was Curly Bill Brocious, a member of the outlaw cowboy gang. After Marshal White's death, Wyatt Earp took Curly Bill to Tucson for trial. Wyatt testified as to what he saw that night. I was in Billy Owen's saloon and heard three or four shots fired. Upon hearing light first shot, I ran out to the street and I saw the flash of a pistol up the street about a block from where I was. Several shots were fired in quick succession. I ran up as quick as I could and when I got there I met my brother Morgan Earp. I asked my brother who it was that did that shooting. He said he didn't know some fellows who ran behind that building. I asked him for his six-shooter. After I got the pistol, I ran around the building. But before I got there, I heard White say, I'm an officer, give me your pistol. And just as I was almost there, I saw the defendant pull his pistol out of his scabbard and Marshal White grabbed hold of the barrel of it. The parties were not more than two feet apart, facing each other. Both had hold of the pistol and just then I threw my arms around the defendant to see if he had any other weapons, and looked over his shoulder, and White saw me and said, Now you goddamn son of a bitch, give up that pistol. And he gave a quick jerk, and the pistol went off. White had it in his hands, and when he fell to the ground shot, the pistol dropped and I picked it up. The defendant stood still from the time I first saw him until the pistol went off. When I took him in charge, he said, What have I done? I have not done anything to be arrested for. Before he died, Marshal White said he believed Curly Bill Brocious had shot him by accident. White's testimony, that the Marshal had jerked the barrel before it shot, seems to support this. A gunsmith testified that there was a flaw in the gun, allowing it to be fired when half-cocked. Curly Bill was acquitted, but nonetheless, Wyatt hadn't made any friends among the cowboys. In the months ahead, the Earps and the cowboys would clash again, with Wyatt's friend Doc Holliday 
throwing gasoline on the fire. At the same time, local politics would drive the issue even harder as a new sheriff came into town and seemed to align himself more with the cowboys. It would all come to a head one year after Marshall White's death. On October 26th, 1881, the Earps and Doc Holliday would stand together to face four cowboys. But the deaths that occurred there would be only the start, setting off a bloody feud that would leave casualties on both sides. Even Wyatt Earp would abandon law and order on his vendetta ride and the cowboys would see the dark fury of this particular lawman of the West. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.